Okay, but I think now it's exactly 12 p.m. here in the East Coast and Sheva Be'erev Eretz Yisrael, and it's a pleasure to welcome Shuli back and uh, really uh, thank you. And uh, it's, as we were discussing, as you're here, you know, it's not an easy time and uh, it's kids in the army and uh, we just wish you to hear good things, but we all need it. Right. People in Israel, people around the world. So, and uh, obviously very appropriate for this time uh, where this series, as you all know, is going to be on the gates of Gaza and a uh, six-part series on Gaza in Jewish history and uh we should hope the Jewish history will improve in, in Gaza. But uh, And I want to thank uh, this series is being sponsored by our good friend Sharon and uh, Marty Goldberg in Toronto uh, in memory of Sharon's 15th yard site of her father, Yecheskel ben Yerachmiel. The yard site is the 11th of Shvat, but she'll be sponsoring the whole series. We want to thank the Goldberg, Sharon and Marty uh, for their, their friendship and support. And uh, okay, Shuli Vakasha, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Rabbi Kelman. Thank you, Goldbergs. It's a beautiful idea. Um, and of course, our learning, as always, is for the Rifu Ashlema of all of the wounded, for the safe and immediate return of uh, our hostages, for the success of our soldiers. All, all the good things. Um, okay, so the idea for this course, of course, is in current events. Um, we've been all been glued to the news, some of us more, some of us less, depending on our personal capabilities. Um, and uh, we've suddenly all become experts on where is Khan Yunus and where is Rafa and where is Be'eri and all. these names that perhaps were not exactly household names for most of us, we're suddenly talking about them all the time. Um, but there's a history here before October 7th. Uh, and it's a very rich and important history. Um, this area is not what we, we would call the heartland of Eretz Yisrael, what we'd say the mountains, Hebron, Jerusalem, Be'er Sheva, uh, Shiloh, but it certainly is an important part of the history of the land of Israel for millennia, um, and certainly in the last, in the modern era. So that's what we're going to try to explore in this six-part six class. Um, today, we're going to do an introduction about the area, some of the geography, the topography, uh, and we're also going to take a look at Tanakh times, right? Who's living in this area in Tanakh? What do we know about it? Um, Next time, we're going to actually go deeper into Gaza itself, Aza, the city of Aza, uh, which has a, a fascinating Jewish history. And we're going to take a look at Aza pretty much from Second Temple times to the 20th century up until 1948, not really including 1948. But we'll get a sense, a lot of medieval history. There's a lot to talk about. Um, after that, we're going to look at the area of what we call the Gaza envelope, right? Otef Aza, the areas that are not in Gaza itself, but nearby in the 1940s, the settlements that's there, how important this area was in the War of Independence in 1948. Um, our fourth class is going to be the 50s and 60s, the early settlement in these areas, as well as the waves of immigration and the development towns, right? The other names that we've been hearing are Sterot, Ofakim, Nitivot. So we're going to talk about those places as well. Um, the fifth class, we're going to talk about what happened with the Six-Day War. Okay, the the we'll call it the boom and the bust, right? Gush Katif settlement in the northern part of Sinai, Yamit, uh, and then what happened to those places? And we'll finish up with the area today. Okay, so that's just to give us kind of an outline of what we're talking about. Um, I brought this amazing satellite picture. I, I love it. I think it's just great because it really gives us a sense. Um, first of all, you know, we're, we're not just our little country. Sometimes we feel that we are, but we are so connected uh, geographically to our neighbors, even if politically we're not always connected to our neighbors. Uh, and what you see in this picture, which I think is, is wonderful, is how close, well, let's just understand what we're looking at here, okay? So we're obviously looking at the land of Israel over here, right? The state of Israel, let's talk, call it that, okay? The area of the coast, the southern area of the coast is this area of the Gaza Strip, 
it's also informative to see where the lights are, right? Where there's civilization, where there's uh, buildings as opposed to desert and agriculture that's kind of more empty, okay? Uh, but if we continue down the coast, this of course is already the northern part of Sinai, which today is no longer under Israeli control, uh, but was from 67 till we gave you meat to the Egyptians in the early 80s. And if you continue all the way along the coast, of course, you will get to Egypt, right? You will get to this. The, the lights are, are very informative for us because this is, of course, the trajectory of the Nile. The big burst of light is Cairo, right? And then we spread out into the Nile Delta, okay? So just to understand that connection between Egypt and Eretz Israel, and it largely goes along this area of the coast, the northern part of Sinai. We're going to talk about Sinai a little bit today, more in that fifth class, uh, but we're going to be talking about the northern part of Sinai. We're not going to talk about the south, about uh, Taba, about the areas uh, of where maybe Mount Sinai is. That's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about northern Sinai. Okay, so that's just to give us a little bit of a, a sense, kind of a larger sense of the whole area. It used to be much better, this annotating tool. Now it's very annoying, the erasing. Sorry. Okay. Moving right along. Let's get rid of this. And um, okay. The satellite photo for people who are asking, all you got to do is Google everything. I'm Most of the things I take are from Wikipedia. Um, and I believe this is a Wikipedia article about Sinai. If I find it, I will send it to Rabbi Kelman, who will send it out. Uh, but try to Google Sinai Wikipedia article, and you should be finding it. Okay, let's talk about the Negev. We're going to talk about the coast mostly, but we're also going to talk about other parts of the Negev. Okay, uh, the word Negev, very interesting word, right? If you know Hebrew, the word should mean to you, should have some meaning to you, Linagev or a Magevet right? It comes from something dry, right? Here in Israel, we are minagevet hummus, right? We wipe up our hummus with the pita. So linagev is something that's dry, and that's really the definition of the negev. The negev only has natural borders, okay? Um, uh, in the south, right, where we have uh, the the Gulf, right, we have uh, where the Red Sea is, uh, and uh, Aqaba and Taba, and we also have here the area of the Arava, right, the Great Jordan Valley Rift. But in the north and in the west, we don't have natural borders, and the Negev is really defined by rainfall, okay? Less than 200 millimeters of rainfall a year means Negev, okay? Especially this is particularly important in the north, okay? The rainfall varies throughout. Um, in general, we talk about Tanakh borders, okay? The classic border in Tanakh, what did we say in the, in the book of Melachim when it talks about King Solomon's kingdom? It says he's ruling Midan ve'ad Be'er Sheva, right? From Dan in the north to Be'er Sheva in the south. Yes, we hear about King Solomon who has a port city down in Elat, okay? At Zion Gavra not a lot, um, and uh, how he has, you know, trade ties with Ethiopia, with other countries, but really there's no habitation south of Beersheba. It's very hard to live south of Beersheba. We're going to see this when we get to talking about the border in Tanakh times of Beersheba and Arad, um, but it doesn't mean that this is not included in the area of the Negev. And we'll see next time when we talk about the Nabataeans, they are able to actually conquer this area, conquer it in the sense of being able to have trade routes and figure out how to live here. So that's uh, that's important to understand. Um, another thing that's just interesting, right? When we draw our little map of Israel, right? We all know how to draw that nice little map with the little triangle on the bottom. But think about it for a second. What is this line, right? This line over here, this, this western border of the country, it's a rather uh, an arbitrary line because really climatically, is that the right word, right? Topographically and climate, this is not, the negative is not so different from what's across the international border in Sinai. What is this border? Where does it come from? It actually comes from the British, right? Okay? 
100 and almost 20 years ago, 1906, the British are controlling Egypt. The Suez Canal has been built. Meanwhile, what's happening in 1906 in the land of Israel, the Ottoman Turks are here. The British do not want the Ottoman Turks anywhere near to the Suez Canal. They want to keep them far away. Suez Canal, of course, is to the west of us over here. So they draw this border that basically begins in Rafa over here, what we call in Hebrew Rafiach, but it's Rafa, right? And it goes down to Taba over here, and they draw a more or less straight line, right? If you know a little bit about uh, the history of the modern Middle East, you know that there were a lot of arbitrary lines that were drawn, whether it was by the British or by the French, right? And this is a line that they drew, which is still the uh, the border today. So that's what we have over here in terms of this uh, this side of the triangle. Um, just to look a little bit closer in the map here, right? We have the bigger cities of Beersheba. Uh, it's Paramount is hardly a big city, but it's important. Here's our border over here, right? Nitsana, Ezuz. And on the other side, we have the area of the Arava going all the way down to Elat. Okay, so that's just to give us a little bit geographical borders. Um, we are going to be zooming in, not so much this class, but in the following class, on the area that we call the Gaza envelope and Gaza, okay? So this area of Gaza, of course, we have the city, right? The city of Gaza or Aza that's been around for a very, very long time. We hear about it in uh, Egyptian texts and, of course, in our text. In Tanakh, we're going to see it's one of the Philistine cities, right? So this is the area, the city of Aza. The whole area is known as the, the uh, Gaza Strip, right? Um, but the area around it is called the Gaza envelope, or in Hebrew, Otef Aza. And that's really what you've been seeing a lot of in the news. Um, and it goes, it, it's really this western and northern Negev. Okay? And as we're going to see, it's an area that's very, very fertile, as opposed to kind of further east and further south. So this is kind of a, a, a zoom in over here. Um, in the picture on the left, in the picture on the right, just point out a few places that I think are important for us to be aware of. Okay, we have, of course, Beiri down here, okay? Nachal Oz, Kfar Aza. These are all names that are going to be coming up in later classes, Nativa Asara. These are, of course, the modern names, the Israeli communities that were created, uh, whether in the 1940s or afterwards with the beginning of the State of Israel. Hey, but we're going to see that there are older things here as well. Um, and we also have the cities, right? Like Sderot, like Nitivot, which is not in this picture. Oh, here it is, all the way down at the bottom, okay? What we call the development town. So we're going to come back to all those places and just to be aware of them, okay? So that's what we have here, just a race, so just to give us a sense geographically of where we are. All right. Yes, a race. Mm -hmm. Fine. Um, okay. Uh, why is the Western border not straight? That's a good question. Uh, I assume that those those bumps are topographical, but again, we'd have to go back to what the British say. <laughs> All right, let's um, let's talk about why this area is so important. Okay, um, in in modern Israel today, it, it wasn't. It was considered to be like sort of on the edge of the country, but really historically, this is a super important area. Okay, it's the entrance to the land, both by the sea. Okay, it's one of the entrances by the sea. You don't have to come in through the port of Gaza, but of course that was an important port throughout history. You could also come in through Ashkelon, uh, through Haifa, through Caesarea, right? All those different places, but it definitely is one of the sea entrances to the land, but it's also one of the land entrances. If you're coming from Egypt, okay, you are not going to be crossing through the desert by the Sinai. That's not a smart way to do it. You want to be traveling. If you're not going to be traveling by sea, you're going to be at least traveling through the areas that are more fertile. OK, um, and you're also going to want to be hooking up to the very important road that if you, you know a little bit of Tanakh, you know how important this road is. And that's the Via Maris, Derek the Derech Hayam, right? The sea route, the sea route that goes up the coast Derek and ultimately... Wisdom. What? Derek, police him. Okay, we're going to get to that. Wait. Yeah. 
Okay, you, you're ready. You're not going to come the, on the land. The you're going to come by the sea. The there is a leash him. By okay, him, wait. Perot. Who's talking here? Who is that? By you? Okay. Yes, we're getting there. Hold on. Hold on. Have, have patience. Okay. I know it's very hard. Okay. So this is a great way to travel. You're going to travel along here. You're going to hook up to the, the Derech Hayam, the Via Maris. This is a very classic way to travel. Now, because of that, eh, the Egyptians understood it was a very classic way to travel. They fortified this area. First of all, when we talk, we talk about the first, uh, the first of Am Yisrael who come down to Egypt, we don't have to get to, to Jacob and his sons. We're talking about Avraham, right? Avraham goes down to Egypt. We don't have a description in the Torah how he's going, but it makes sense that this is the route that he is traveling, okay? That he's coming down here from the area of Aza, that he's passing by uh, Wadi El Arish, what, what many people think is Nachal Mitzrayim, from Wadi El Arish down to the center over here by very close to the the Nile is the two to three day walk. Right? To us, that's like, whoa, how could you possibly do that? But in ancient times, that's a very classic thing to do. Okay? Now, because this is a well-traveled and relatively easy route, the Egyptians are using it all the time. Okay, We know from the 15th to the 12th century before the Common Era, that's the time period beginning with the conquest of Eretz Canaan by Paro Tutmos. And for the next two and a half centuries, the Egyptians are ruling in the land of Canaan. And there's a lot of of travel back and forth, okay? Supplies, trade, military, they're traveling back and forth. This is the area, this is the way that they are going. They also don't want people to either break into Egypt or escape from Egypt, i.e. Am Israel in the time of the Exodus. And so we know that in this time period, the 15th to the 12th century, the Egyptians build fortresses along this route. They build fortresses, they have food, they have water, they have soldiers to make sure that people are not ex escaping. And that's where we get to the famous psukim that we're going to come up on Parshat Shavua in a couple of weeks, right? Vayihi b'shalach paro et ha'am v'lo nacham Elohim derech eretz plishtim ki karov hu ki amar Elohim penyachem ha'am birotam melchama v'shavu mitraim. God does not bring us by the way of the land of the plishtim. Okay, this is the classic way to leave Egypt. You're going to go along here. Some people even say, by the way, the Kriyat Yamsuf is happening up here by the Bardawil Lake. It's not such an accepted opinion, but it's an idea, right? But God doesn't want us to go this way because we're going to come through the land of the Philistines. We're going to have to be go past this gauntlet of all of these military fortresses before we even get to the Philistines. By the way, uh, the Bible scholar uh, Moshe David Kasuto doesn't think that this is what Derech Eretz Plishtim means. He says there's three possible ways to go into the land from Egypt. One is this way. He says, no way. The people would never, nobody would even consider going this way. It's so fortified. It's a crazy idea. He says there's the middle way, which is going essentially up towards Beersheba. He says that's that's Derech Eretz Plishtim, who, which Plishtim, we're going to talk about them in a few minutes. The old Philistines, the ones who lived in Gerar, not the Philistines who are coming from Greece, but the ones of Avimelech. And the, he says that's the way that God doesn't want them to go because they'll get into the land too quickly and they'll have to go into battle. Instead, God takes them the southern way, right? This kind of a very strange way of going all the way down and around, right? But we, whether we're talking about going this way or this way, in any case, we're going to have to run into battles and God doesn't want that to happen. But once we get a sense of this connection to Egypt, right, we understand why Aza is so strategically important. And when we get to our class next time, when we talk about uh, who conquers Aza, we're going to see conquest on, after conquest after conquest after conquest. Everybody wants to control Aza. It's a gateway into the land. 
Okay, so that's very important to understand kind of the larger context of what we're talking about. Okay, one other thing, and this is just interesting um, to understand what is included in the land of Israel, because Gaza is also part of that story. Uh, we have what are called the maximalist borders and the minimalist borders. Okay, uh, the maximalist borders, God promises to Abraham in Brit Ben Habitarim. He says, your border is going to go from the Nahar Hagadol, Nahar Prat, the Euphrates, all the way up here to Nehar Mitzrayim, which most people understand as the Nile. Okay, so that is a very, very large and expansionist land of Israel, which has not happened yet. Who knows? Maybe one day. Okay, but in Sefer Bamidbar, towards the end of Sefer Bamidbar in uh, Parak Lamedal, chapter 34, you have a much more... Um, realistic, practical borders, which go from the area of Hor Hahar up here in Lebanon, and they go down to not Nehar Mitzrayim, but Nachal Mitzrayim, Nachal Mitzrayim, Wadi, right? A smaller a river, not the huge Nile River, which many people say is Wadi El Arish, is this El Arish River. And those are borders that more or less, we do have uh, in in uh, time periods of Tanakh, uh, Second Temple times in certain time periods. Okay, um, again, this area, as we're going to see as we go on, de, de jure, right, is given to the tribe of Judah. De facto, we're going to see other nations are controlling it for a lot of the time. But in terms of borders, at least practical borders, as opposed to on the left here, which what you'd probably call utopian borders, right? But the practical borders that actually happen, the one here on the right, that goes and includes this area of Aza. So there definitely is a basis to say that this is included in the borders of the land of Israel throughout history. Okay? Surely, uh, surely, could, could I, surely could the Rafah is, is, trans, is the translation ostensibly of uncles of the word chatserim in in dvarim are you familiar rafa with rafa is translated by uncles chatserim is translated as rafa that's what, yes. what some people how some people read it and your targum yunatan especially suggests interesting i i would have to look back i don't know that's a very interesting point right chatserim is further south so Where is chatserim can you show it to us there Chatzerim, today we talk about Chatzerim near Be'er Sheva, um, but I believe Tanakh Chatzerim is further deep in the Negev. I would have to go back and look. I don't know off the top of my head. Well, well that's very interesting. Okay. Because Onkelos seems to identify, possibly identifies it with Rafa. And that would connect. All right. Them, it's uh, Tzarek Iyun. Thank you. And from uh, what I'll you try say, and that would connect it. it with Nacha Mitzrayim, right? Is that, am I right? Um, Nacha Mitzrayim is further west, right? Rafa is over here. Nacha Mitzrayim is further west. Close, but not exactly. Okay, what let's go Boach back. What? Boacha Girara Ar Aza. In okay, the, right. Aza is often and, mentioned and, as a as a part of the border. Um, okay, I think what we're going to do is we're going to ask people to put comments like right in the in the chat, and then we'll come back at the end to people's questions. Okay, thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. It's just hard to get through everything. Um, I'll try. I don't promise I'll answer everything. Okay, let's go back to the larger picture of the Negev and the issues of the Negev. Okay? Anyone who wants to successfully live in this area throughout history, even till today, has to figure out the water problem, okay? Water is the issue. Water is the issue in the time of the Avot. We're going to see digging the wells, right? Avraham Yitzchak, it's through the, the, the medieval period, and it's in the 1940s where we're searching for water. Water is always something that you have to find, you have to preserve, you have to be able to safeguard for your communities. So uh, we have cisterns, okay? Um, we have aqueducts, 
that collect rainwater, and we also have wells. So we're going to see a few examples, but that's something that we're always going to have to think about. Okay, so in the pictures that I brought you here on the left, this is a, a picture of a Nabataean cistern. Okay, we'll talk about the Nabataeans next time. Nabataeans are Arabs. They are nomads originally, then they eventually settled down. They're traders, uh, and they figure out how to capture rainwater and put it in cisterns, often secret, hidden from travelers, but that way they are able to really tame the desert. So this is Nabataean cisterns. The picture here on the right is a picture from a place we're going to talk about a lot in a minute, and that's Tel Sheva, okay, uh, to the east of Beersheba, where we have actually two different water systems that sustain, sustain the city. One is huge cisterns that are fed by floodwaters. The other one is this well. Okay, This is a well that was dug millennia ago, dug 70 meters deep, over 200 feet deep to get down to groundwater. Okay, the trough over here is modern reconstruction, but the well is the original well. So you have to figure out how to get the water. Um, less in our area to the west in the Gaza envelope, but more in the center part of the Negev, you do have flash floods, okay? Flash floods where you have water rain in one area that then flows to the lowest place. Here you have this fantastic picture of a flash flood in Nahaltzin, okay, uh, a little bit uh, south south of Beersheba, um, Ein of Dat, and you have this huge amount of water that comes and cascades into, uh, hopefully, into aqueducts and into cisterns or just into kind of open pools. Uh, it comes all at once. If you're able to capture that, then that's something that is going to keep you going for the very dry summer months, right? And we have this, of course, in Tehillim, Ka'afikim Negev, as water channels in the Negev. Um, and this is a, a beautiful image that that we have that David Hamelch tells us in Sefer Tilim. Let's get a little bit into the time of the Avot, okay? Um, the Avot, uh, primarily Avram and Yitzchak, Yaakov also somewhat, uh, are all over the Negev, right? We keep hearing about digging wells. We hear about Avram and Yitzchak in Beersheba. We hear about this place called Gerar, Eretz Gerar, right? As, as well as kind of a, a city or a settlement of Gerar. We hear about Kadesh. We hear about Shur. What do we have from those time periods of the Avot? So the first thing that a lot of people think of is they say, okay, let's go to Beersheba, right? Beersheba. Beersheba, great, we'll go to Beersheba. Uh, and if you go to Beersheba, to the old part of the town, you will actually be able to go to a tourist attraction that is called Be'er Avraham, Abraham's well. Sad to say, it is not Abraham's well. Okay? It is a well that goes back to Byzantine times. It's not modern, but it does not go back to Abraham. Um, the picture on the left here is a great picture from, uh, it's either Turkish times or British times. Uh, of Bedouin by Abraham's well. Today, there's a whole tourist site that's been built around it. But Beersheba of today, right? Be Be Beersheba, even the old city of Beersheba is a modern city. Beersheba was built by the Ottoman Turks in the early part of the 20th century because it was meant to be a way to kind of contain the Bedouin. They wanted to have a city down there. They wanted to have uh, administration down there. Uh, it's captured very spectacularly by the British in World War I, but it is a modern city. It is not the Beersheba of the time of the Avot. Uh, and the question is, where is the Beersheba of the time of the Avot? Uh, and if you go slightly to the east of Beersheba, and that's why I brought you the map here, right? Beersheba today is a, is a real metropolis. If you haven't been in Beersheba in the last 20 years, it's, it's incredible what's being done there, Ben Gurion University and uh, and Soroka Hospital and many museums and new neighborhoods and also beautiful parks, right? But if you go slightly to the east of modern Beersheba, right next to Ikea, right, you will get to what is called Tel Sheva. Here on this map, it's called Tel Be'er Sheva. That's not necessarily accurate, okay? And very close to that is the Bedouin town, one of the seven Bedouin towns built by Israel, Bedouin town called Tel Sheva, okay? What is this Tel Sheva or Tel Be'er Sheva? So you say, okay, wonderful. This is an ancient town. It's an archeological site. This must be the Be'er Sheva of the Avot. 
but it's not, all right? Because we have no layer of sediment from the time of the Avot. We have a layer of sediment earlier, right, from prehistoric times. We have a small layer of sediment from the time period of Yoshua, right, the beginnings of the Israelite settlement in the land. It grows and its main, what we see when you go to the site today is a, uh, a small but very well planned town from the ninth to the eighth century, okay, from the time of King Hezekiah, Hezkiyahu. We have no settlement from the time of the Avot, okay? So what's going on here, right? Where's our Beersheba of the Avot? So first of all, something very important, um, Rav Yol Bin Nun talks about this. He says, if you look in Tanakh, if you look in Sefer Yoshua, Sefer Yoshua actually talks about two places. One is called Be'er Sheva. Okay? This is in the, the list of the Nachala of Shimon, of the, the tribe of Shimon. One is called Be'er Sheva and one is called Sheva. There are two separate places, Be'er Sheva and Sheva. The Arabs also, the Arabs have a place called Bir Asava, Be'er Sheva, and they have another place called Tel Asava, Tel Sheva, right? There are two different places. It doesn't solve our question of where is Be'er Sheva of the Avot, but it does tell us that this is not Be'er Sheva of the Avot, and presumably where the uh, Abraham's well is, is not either. Could it be somewhere else in modern Be'er Sheva? Yes, it could. Okay. Could it be something that we haven't found yet? Could it be in a few different places? Because as we have droughts and we have good years and we have bad years, places might have moved, right? And the Beersheba of Abraham might not have been the Beersheba of Isaac. It might not have been the Beersheba of Eliyahu, right? It, it could have moved from place to place because of the availability of water. Once we're here in Tel Sheva, let's talk about it for a few minutes because it really is a very, very interesting city. Um, it's uh, for what it's worth, which I don't think it's worth so much. Uh, Tel Sheva is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, why is it chosen by UNESCO? Because it's considered to be a classic biblical city. Okay? It has uh, it has certain uh, architectural features that biblical cities have, that Israelite cities, or in this case, a Judahite city, has a uh, casemate wall, four-room houses, uh, storerooms, water system, right? It's a very, it's considered to be a classic uh, biblical town. Uh, as we said, it's a city that really comes to its, its greatest importance in the time of King Hezekiah, Chizkiyahu, okay? eighth century before the Common Era. Uh, Chizkiyahu is a, is a powerful king in the kingdom of Judah, uh, and he fortifies the borders Okay. And Beersheba is one of the border towns. Okay, Beersheba is kind of the, the western border town. And on the same line is Arad that we're going to come to in a minute. So what we're looking at here are storerooms that were built by uh, in the time of Chizkiyahu. We're looking at a four-room house. These are houses that are built around the walls. The city was very, very well planned. Okay, you have, it's kind of a circle with the houses built in the walls. You have an inner gate, you have an outer gate. This is a picture of the inner gate here. Um, the walls are built out of mud bricks and stone. So they're very, very strong. There's a sophisticated water system. That's what you're seeing here on the right that collects runoff from the Wadi Hebron, from Nachal Hebron. You have drainage under the streets. This is a great city. What's fascinating about it is it's a very small city. Okay? There are about 75 houses that we've discovered. It's all within the, the walls. Enough room for give or take 400 people. Okay? Why would you work so hard to build such a well-planned city that's so small? Because this is a perk. This is for the administrators. This is for the guys who are living on the border they're either administrators or they're soldiers. They're collecting taxes. They're protecting the border. So we're going to build you a nice city that's going to be well protected and that you're going to want to live in. Now, uh, the other really fascinating thing that was found in Tel Sheva uh, is this altar. Okay, if you want to see the real one, you have to go to the Israel Museum. There's a rebuilt, like a, a reconstructed one uh, in the site at Tel Sheva. Why is this so fascinating? Because if you look at it, if you look at the, the authentic one here on the left, you can see the real stones of the altar, but you can also see parts that are filled in, right, with, I don't know what this is, some modern material, okay, concrete. This altar was not discovered whole, 
It was discovered dismantled in a basement of one of the houses of Tel Sheva. Okay, why would you dismantle this lovely altar? This is a great proof of the reform, the religious reform that we know from Tanakh that King Hezekiah does. He decides he's going to get rid of all the idolatry, but not only all the idolatry, he's going to get rid of all of the outside temples, right? This is a very tempting thing. People want to have a temple close to their home, so they build their own temples. And we know from the prophets, we have temples in Beersheba and Beit El and all different places in Dan. This is part of a temple, or maybe it's just an altar that was built in this border town. And then King Hezekiah sends his reformers and they come to the town and they say, hi, you guys have a month to get rid of your altar. We'll be back to check. The king doesn't allow it. Now, if you have an altar that's holy to you, you're not going to destroy it. What are you going to do? You're going to dismantle it and put it in Geniza. You're going to put it away somewhere. And that's exactly what we found. The other fascinating thing about it is it is an altar that looks a lot like the altar that was in the temple, except it has a few things that are off. Okay. First of all, if you look, these stones are yun stones. They are cut with metal, something that we are not allowed to do um, in the temple. Okay, you have to have field stones, stones that you pick up. You can't have stones that are cut with metal. The corners, we have corners on the altar in the temple, but they're not so rounded. These are kind of very, um, what's the word, zoomorphic, right? They look a lot like animal horns. We don't have that in the temple. And the most fascinating thing is what you have here, okay, this these zigzaggy lines, okay? We think that this is meant to signify a snake, Right? And if you look at the Gemara, and the Gemara talks about Hezekiah's reforms, actually not the Gemara, the Tanakh as well, talks about how he destroys the Nachash Nechoshet, the copper serpent that was made by Moses in the desert. Is this meant to be maybe some kind of symbol of this serpent that began to be worshipped? Okay, we're not going to go too deeply into this, but it, but Tel Sheva is a fascinating place. Okay, Um we will come back to uh, to the area of the border, but I want to talk a little bit about Grar. Okay, when you read the stories about the Avot, one of the places that keeps jumping out over and over again, both for Avraham and for Yitzchak, is Grar. Okay, um, so just I brought you a few sources here. Avraham journeyed to the region of the Negev and settled between Kadesh and Shur, at, right, by Yeshev between Kadesh and Shur, sojourned, right? Two different verbs in Grar, right? Again, there was a famine in the land. Uh, Yitzchak went to Avimelech, king of the Philistines, in Grar. Right? Then we have all the stories of the wells. Avram digs wells. Yitzchak digs wells. Right? Um, they both managed to go to these places in times of famine right? and to survive there and even to find water there. Right? And we even have a story, I didn't bring you this verse here, but it talks about Yitzchak and how he becomes so well-to-do that he is able to have, his agriculture is super successful, right? Um, but Yisra, right? He, he, he plants and he reaps mea sha'arim a hundred times as much as he reaps. That's what he sows. So it has to be a place that has a potential for agriculture, for fertile land. Where is this place? Just a side note, right? Uh, we hear about these Philistines, plishtim. These are not the plishtim of later Jewish history. These are not the plishtim of the book of Judges, of the book of Samuel. Those are Philistines. We're going to talk about them. Hopefully we'll get to them today. Uh, that are coming from the Aegean Sea, from the Greek islands. These are other people, whether they are an early version of those Philistines, right, uh, a wave that came earlier, or more likely, these are Semitic peoples who are just called Philistines because they're living in a place that eventually is called places of the Philistines, right? But we're not going to go into that question too much. We want to understand where is Grar, okay? Um, so we know that both the Gemara and the Byzantine Christian writer Eusebius talk about a place called Grar Tiki, right? Say can keeps the name, and, and it's in uh, it's in this area. Uh, although they place it further south, right? Um, sorry, they they place it in the area of um, 
this Gaza envelope. Okay? Um, we have a few suggestions. Professor Yoel Elitsur talks about this question, uh, and he identifies basically two potential candidates for where is Grar, two tells, two archaeological sites. One is called Tel Haror, okay? It's here just a little bit south of Nitivot on Route 25. The other one is called Tel Jama, okay? And this is in the forest, not far from Re'im, from Be'eri, okay? This is an area that is very popular in Israel in the wintertime because this is where all the kalaniot, the anemones are blooming. So we have these two sites, Tel Haror and Tel Jama. Tel Haror is a good candidate because it does have a settlement layer from the time period of the Avot. However, the climate is not so great here. Tel Jama, on the other hand, is an area that is super fertile. And in fact, I'll see in a second, I'll show you pictures of these two tells. Okay. Um, on the left here is Tel Jama of today. On the right is Tel Haror. Uh, Professor Yerlitzur says Tel Jama, he thinks, is the right answer. He says, if Avram is going to go and Yitzchak is going to go somewhere where there's a drought and they want to be able to have successful agriculture, Tel Haror, not so good. Not so many water sources, not so great for agriculture. Tel Jama, on the other hand, is a place that is super fertile. And we are seeing this today in Israel. We see it all the time. We are in an agricultural crisis because so much of our breadbasket is from this area, is from this area of the Gaza envelope. Uh, the picture on the bottom here is of the fields uh, right around Tel Jama today in the area near Kibbutz Re'im. Um, this is an area that is super fertile, and this is where we get our potatoes and where we get our avocados and where we get our tomatoes, and so many things are grown down there, and it's a place that has enormous potential for agriculture. So uh, I, I would have to agree with Professor Elitzur that Tel Jama Grar is going to be, let's just go back for a second, right, closer to this area of Aza, okay, closer to the Gaza envelope, um, in the Gaza envelope, right on this, and you can even see in this great satellite picture, so many of the fields that are here, and this is really the breadbasket of Israel. So that's one of our questions uh, about Gerar. Um, let's talk a little about the time period of Israelite settlement, okay? Uh, and that's Shimon, okay? Um, we said much of this area is Yehuda, is the Nahala, is the, the tribal inheritance of Judah. Really, they're given the area on the coast as well, but as we're going to see in a moment, they are not able to conquer it for very long, uh, for a long time, because this is controlled by the Philistines. But if you read the ostensibly very boring chapters in Sefer Yoshua that tell you about all the Nahalot, you will see that Shimon is actually kind of an enclave within the larger tribe of Judah. And and that's a very interesting thing, because if you follow the history of the tribe of Shimon, and it's only mentioned here and there, you have to really search for it. The tribe of Shimon is nomadic. It wanders. Um, first, we hear about it deep in the heart of the desert uh, of the Negev of Judah. Later on, they're pushed out when King David becomes more powerful uh, and there's more settlement in the Negev. Shimon is pushed further south. Later on, that doesn't work. They don't want them there. They're pushed to the north. Eventually, they end up also in the east. What's going on here? So we know that in the, in the blessings, and in this case, really the curse that Jacob gives to his sons at the end of his life, right, our Parsha two weeks ago, he talks about Shimon and Levi, right? Simon and Levi. He doesn't like how they work together. The story of them with with uh, with Shem, uh, and he says Shimon and Levi achim hem klei Hamas mechorotehem. They do all these terrible things. Achal kem bi Yaakov vaafitzem bi Israel. I'm going to split them up. I don't want them together, right? Those two kids that don't behave in the back of the classroom. You move them to either end of the classroom. You don't have them sit together. So Levi and Shimon are split up. Now, how does that actually happen? It happens in a very interesting way. Levi is split up throughout the land. He doesn't get his own area. He is in all of the different, not all, but most of the different tribes have Levite cities. They are spread out throughout. Shimon, on the other hand, does get a Nachala, 
but it's moves. It moves from place to place. He never has a permanent place. Today in modern Israel, if you go down south, you will get to an area that is called the local council, the Moiza Ezorit B'nai Shimon. It's the area of the sons of Shimon. It's kind of not saying Shimon because it's acknowledging that Shimon really did move from place to place, but their legacy is also down here. Okay, one last place that we're going to talk about that's Israelite, and then we're going to get to a little bit of the uh, of the, our enemies who are also in this area, uh, and that's Tel Arad. Okay, uh, Arad is on the same latitude as Beersheba. Okay, it's uh, you just go basically do east of Beersheba and you will get to Tel Arad. Uh, and you, this is another border town. This is a town that was part of the fortifications of the Israelites, of the kingdom of Judah, really, in the south. And nobody really lives south of there. But Arad, uh, different from Tel Sheva, has a really fascinating story. Because as you can see in the timeline, it has a, an archaeological layer of hundreds of years as a very large and very prosperous Canaanite city in the early bronze period, even before the time of the Avot. It's part of, it's on a trade route. Um, it seems to have been able to sustain hundreds, if not thousands of people. Um, and, and there's some discussion oh. about climate change, maybe weather there. It's, it's a very interesting thing. But then you have a break of 1,500 years where nobody lives there. It's really fascinating. You have this thriving city, it comes to a stop, and then you have nothing. And only in the time period of King Solomon, okay, a little bit earlier, you have Israelites who come down here and create a fortress. It's much, much, much smaller than the Canaanite city. It's expanded from, from Solomon to Uzziah, but it's still not a, a very large place at all. Okay? Um, and it lasts until the destruction of the first temple, okay, where it also is destroyed, uh, unlike uh, Tel Sheva, which is already destroyed in the time of Chizkiyahu and San Chiriv. Tel Arad lasts longer, but probably the most fascinating thing in the fortress, the Israelite fortress of Tel Arad, is not just an altar, but an entire temple that is put into Geniza. Okay? In Tel Sheva, we saw that Chizkiyahu comes along, says no more altar, get rid of that altar. They hide the altar in the basement. In Tel Arad, we find not just an altar, but an entire temple that was buried in the reforms either of Chizkiyahu or of his great-grandson, Yoshiao Josiah. It, it's not clear. Scholars are divided. But I just want to point out to you what we find there, because it's amazing. Okay, take a look at this picture on the left. Okay, and what you see in the middle here is an altar. It is an altar, unlike the one in Tel Sheva. It's really an altar that is almost identical to the altar, if not in the temple, certainly in the Mishkan. It's the right size, okay? It's five amot by five amot by three amot high, okay? It's the right material. It's made out of these field stones. It has an area on the top made out of flint that is for, uh, for the actual sacrifices. It really is a time capsule of what an altar might have looked like, right? Might have looked like in the temple and in the, and in the tabernacle. But beyond that, okay, further in, that's if you go in this direction, right, it's really like the temple. The altar is in the outside courtyard. And then as you go further in, you have a Kodesh, right, a holy, and a Kodesh Kodeshim, a holy of holies, with an incense altar in the Kodesh. And in the inner sanctum, you have not an Aron, right, not a holy ark, but you have two statues, sort of, right? Standing stones, which perhaps are meant to signify God, right? It, we're not 100% sure. So is this idolatry? Is it some kind of syncretism? It's a fascinating thing. It's a time capsule of how uh, these soldiers in this fortress worshipped. They couldn't make their way to Jerusalem, but they wanted to have a place to worship. Uh, and they left it for us. Uh, for the future to discover. So that's really, I think, one of my favorite things in Tel Arad. It's really very, very fascinating. Okay, we're going to spend our last 10 minutes 
talking about the Philistines. Hey, when we think about Gaza and we think about the area along the coast, the, the people that come to mind uh, more than the Israelites are really the Philistines. They are the major enemy uh, uh, in Tanakh times from the time period of the judges, right? Shimshon, but even before that, up until pretty much the time of King Solomon. And they stick around. They're still around until the destruction uh, of the land by the Babylonians. They are also conquered by the Babylonians. Uh, they're just not as powerful in those later years, but they're around for a very long time. So what do we know about them and their cities? So uh, unlike many ancient peoples, we actually have pictures of the Philistines, which is great, right? It's not a, you know, it's not great for them because the pictures are of them being taken prisoner. Uh, these are pictures on the walls of the um, the funerary temple of Pararamses, who fought off these invaders who are coming from the west, uh, and he captured them. And in order to you know talk about how wonderful he is, he actually put pictures of them on the walls of his funerary temple. So we can see they are very different looking than the Egyptians. Right? They have these very unusual headdresses. Uh, in some of the other pictures, they have helmets. We actually have other pictures of their boats. We know a lot about them. What, where are they coming from? So we have these people that are called the Sea Peoples. They're not just Philistines. There's a whole bunch of them, right? Uh, there are Shardona, and there, there are all different names that we have that are written about in Egyptian texts uh, and other texts as well. We know that in the 12th century, there's a group of peoples that come from the areas of the Aegean Sea, from uh, Mycena, from the islands of Crete and Cyprus, and even all the way from the area of Sardinia. Okay? Uh, why do they leave and go look for new places to live? There's all kinds of uh, various catastrophes that happen, uh, the eruption of the volcano at Santorini, uh, and this seems to be a time period of emigration. Right? Now, what's fascinating is the 12th century is also more or less the time where we leave Egypt, right? Uh, and we come out and we go in the other direction. We enter the land of Israel from the east. The Philistines and the other sea peoples are coming from the west. First, they go to Egypt. They are not particularly successful there. And the survivors continue up the coast and they go towards the area, of course, of Gaza, but also all uh, along the coast. So we have this, this great migration. It's also important to understand that this time period, the 12th century, is kind of a, a time of a vacuum of power in Egypt. Egyptians are not as powerful as they had been before that. So they're kind of ripe for invasion uh, from other peoples. So that's important to understand. Um, they start out with this very Mycenaean Aegean culture, okay, uh, with their pottery that they bring that has very distinctive imagery of birds on it, with the temples that they have that have these hearths uh, in the middle, with their own language, with their own um, city states which is also coming from their culture, with their culture of fighting, right? Think about David and Goliath, this idea that you have one combatant fighting instead of, you know, one hero, one warrior, instead of everybody fighting. So they're bringing their culture with them. What's fascinating is that as time passes, they become very, very assimilated into the local culture. We're not going to talk about that so much, but it's interesting to understand. Where do they settle, okay? So we have, the Tanakh talks about a pentapolis, which is just a fancy word for five cities. Okay, what are our five cities? Three along the coast: Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod. Two inside. This is not a class about the Philistines, so we're not going to talk about the fascinating rediscovery of Ekron and Gat. But just to understand, those are our two inside cities. But it's not only there, right? They they rule in other places as well. We know that they go up the coast. We have a, a tell called Tel Kasila, which today is in the Eretz Israel Museum in Tel Aviv. They go to Afek, uh, and at the height of their power, the time of King Saul, they even make it into the heartland and all the way up to the Jezreel Valley, to Beit Sha'an, maybe even to Akko, okay? But their, their home base is this area along the coast and slightly inland. Um, they build temples. Okay? Their temples start out, like we said, very much um, like 
they had in their home countries, but eventually uh, they become more Israelite, right, or more Canaanite, meaning they have a progression, a holy, a holy of holies. In the beginning, their temples are just kind of built around the central hearth and they don't have these different rooms, but they start to adapt local worship. Um, what do they worship? That's a really interesting question. Uh, we found various cultic objects. Uh, um, the, the image on the right here is an incense stand, right? You put incense on the top, you burn it. But what's really interesting is the figures around the side, these are musicians playing all different kinds of instruments. Was music part of the religious ritual? Maybe, we really don't know, but it's, it's a very interesting possibility. Uh, on the left, you have, we, we found a lot of these kind of mini temples, uh, models of temples, usually with some kind of a, an idol uh, inside. Um, and, and that's also a fascinating thing. Was it meant to be a temple if you couldn't get to the real temple? Was it meant to be uh, its own object of worship? Tanakh tells us about the god of the Philistine, who's called Dagon, okay, which might be either from grain Dagan, or it might be from Dag, fish, because they're living oh. on the coast. We really don't know. We have not found any images of the god Dagon. Okay. Uh, what we have found are a few interesting things. One is this image here on the left. This was called Ashdoda. We don't really know what it was called. It was found in Ashdod, so it was called Ashdoda. It's some kind of an Id idol that is female. You can see the breasts. It's also a chair. Okay? We've also found all kinds of strange kind of cultic vessels that are very phallic, and that might tie into what we hear about the plishtim, that they're stricken with something that's called a felim, right, which is politely translated as hemorrhoids, but it might be something that's striking more where it hurts if if you understand what I mean, but we we really don't know very much about their gods. The more we're discovering in archaeology, the more we're finding out. This is an altar that was discovered in uh, Tel Asafi, what we are pretty sure is Tel Gat. It's not an altar that lost two of its horns. It's an altar that only has two horns, uh, and this might give us a clue that maybe they worshipped something connected to bulls, to oxen. We really don't know. We know a little more about what they ate and drank because we find evidence of their material culture. Unlike the Israelites and eventually the Canaanites, the Philistines are big pig eaters. Okay, we find uh, we find skeletons, skulls, uh, and bones of pigs in their settlements. Israelites might have worshipped idols, but they didn't eat pigs. But Philistines did. They're big beer drinkers. The vessels on the right here are uh, special jugs that are used for beer. You can see the little straining holes to strain out the hops uh, of the beer. So we know what they ate and drank, even if we're not so sure what they worshipped. Um, one of the cities that is just north of the Gaza Strip, one of the Philistine cities, of course, is Ashkelon. Uh, Ashkelon, we found quite a lot in the excavations there. One of the oldest arches in the world at the entrance to the Canaanite city, but it eventually becomes a Philistine city. Um, Ashkelon has within its name the word Shekel, okay? Oh. Um, and it seems that Ashkelon was a very thriving market city. We've actually, in the excavations, found what are called the chutzot of Ashkelon, just like King Saul talks about it, the markets, the marketplaces of Ashkelon. We found weights, we found uh, balances, we found uh, remains of things that were, um, that were imported. Okay? Um, so Ashkelon was a thriving uh, trade city. Okay? One last thing about the Philistines, we'll talk about burial. Um, and again, it's one of these things that's very mysterious. Um, they acclimated very much, they assimilated very much with the local culture. So when we did excavations down near Rafiach, they found, which is very close to Egypt, they found Philistine burial in these anthropods, which are like mummies, but with very interesting faces, right? So they're taking a, uh, an Egyptian idea and they're kind of adapting it to their own culture. But one of the really fascinating things that was discovered relatively recently was uh, a cemetery on the outskirts of Ashkelon. Over 200 burials 
Okay. No anthropods, no primary and secondary burial, no moving the bodies. They just put the bones into pits um, uh, with some personal items, perfume jug, right? A few other things. That's what you're seeing in this picture, this perfume jug. So this is something that we're still discovering and finding out more from this cemetery, telling us more about the culture of the Philistines. Um, and of course, one of the famous things that Tanakh tells us about is that the Philistines uh, controlled metal production and the Israelites had to go to them to have their agricultural tools sharpened and that they had no swords, right? There were two swords. King Saul and his son, Jonathan had swords. Nobody else had swords. Um, What's interesting is we have found Philistine iron workshops, uh, one in Gat, but we've also found an Israelite iron workshop in Tel Beit Shemesh. So who's correct, right? Did, did they control it? Did they not? Very interesting question. Okay, so I hope that this introduction helped us to understand that even if we are not in the heartland of Eretz Israel, we are definitely part of the land of Israel. Uh, and like I said, we'll see next week more of our real Jewish history in Gaza proper. I am going to take a quick look at the many comments here and see what I can answer. I am speaking a bit slower in the past. Hmm, I don't think so. Okay. The link to the satellite I said I would find. We looked at the border. Uh, 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 okay. Um, freshwater oasis. Where is a freshwater oasis? I don't know. Um, okay. Um, right. The modern freshwater border was oasis was in okay, Gaza. Well, you know. Ah, so we'll get to Gaza and we'll talk about water there. We'll do that next week. Okay. Um, but that is important to understand. Okay. Um, the borders of Aza as in modern borders, again, we'll wait and we'll, we'll talk about that in, when we get to the story of the Egyptians and, uh, and of Gush Katif. Okay. Um, all right. Mute, mute, mute. Sorry. Okay. Um, Beersheba is growing right. Beersheba is amazing. Uh, there's a ton, not only Beersheba, the Ministry of Defense is moving a lot of their infrastructure, and that's not really Beersheba as much as around Beersheba, uh, what's called the Ir HaBahadim and Yerucham, and all those places are growing a lot, which is very important. Um, and we really want to develop the Negev as, as uh, we have a comment here. Okay. Um, Phoenicians, we don't have Phoenician. Where do we have Phoenicians? Philistines, right? Um, Phoenicians are different people. They are essentially Canaanites, the, the sea people, and Phoenicians, no connections, okay? Um, when they became more food secure, Philistines stopped eating pig. I'm not sure if I agree with that. I think that's an interesting possibility, but... Uh, one suggestion is that fewer people stop, the Canaanites stop eating pig because they want to differentiate themselves from the Philistines. They want to say, we are not like these people. Uh, I don't know about food security. That's interesting. If you show me a source, I would be happy to see it. Um, oh, thank you for all the thank yous, everyone. Um, modern day phallus. Oh, okay. That was one thing we, uh, I, I was going to talk about and I did not talk about Palestine, Philistine, very important point. Uh, I will mention it quickly now, but I'll come back to it again next time. The Philistines and the Palestinians are not related. Very important and a common, um, misconception. The name Palestine was given to the land by the Romans because they wanted to erase the Jewish heritage of the land. Our sources do not use, at least our ancient sources, do not use the word Palestine. We talk about Eretz Israel, but the Romans said, let's erase the Jewish identity of this land by taking a name from our ancient enemies who were not even around anymore at this time. This is after the Bar Kokhba revolt. Let's call it Palestine as in the Philistines. Okay, so the Philistines are no longer around. They do not exist. The Romans take the name and say, let's call it Palestine after the Philistines. Um, you know, if you know, you know, early Zionist literature from before 48, the Palestinians are the Jews. 
Okay, we have the Palestine Post. Some people even have uh, Palestinian uh, ID cards. Okay, if you read old books from the 1940s, it talks about the Jews in Palestine. Okay, but the Fal the Palestinians not connected. Okay, Sir Philadelphia um, has nothing to do with uh, yes Philadelphia. I, I remember it. I have to go back and check. We'll do that when we talk more about modern Gaza. So that, remind me if I don't talk about it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Please Julie, come back next week. Any other comments? Yes. Julie, the, the whole concept of the land Palestine uh, from the mandate was it was is a colonial imposition by the British. The Ottomans never had a separate region Correct. administratively. Correct. So if you want to talk Correct. about Palestine, it's a it's a colonial imposition by the British which the local Arabs picked up on, but it's it was never anything other than that. Correct. Yeah, but the name does go back to the Romans. Uh, and you're right. We were always part of this kind of a larger area, whether it was under the rule of the Romans or the Byzantines or the Ottomans. It was always kind of this Syria-Palestine. Yes, correct. the Egyptians considered it northern Egypt. The Syrians considered it southern uh, Syria. Correct. Correct. Thank you for the clarification. Um, okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you. It should be a Thank good you, end of the week and uh, Bissoroto vote. Uh, Dara, do you want to say something, Dara? You're uh, welcome. Yeah, I want. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question. Um, in terms of when you were uh, referring to the uh, Nachlaot of the of the Shvatim and uh, regarding Shimon, so are. Um, were they not delineated in the in the Tanakh? Like they what, are said... delineated, and Shimon is in the nineteenth chapter of Yoshua. But if you look, and if you if you send me an email, I'll send you the sources. Uh, they they move right, and in Divrei I mean, we hear about them in a different place, and in uh, at the end of Sefer Malachim, we hear about them in a different place. So it's actually a very interesting thing. But yes, they do have their Nachala that is laid out in the book of Joshua. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, and I will try to find that image, uh, the link to the image, and I will send it to Rabbi Kelman, and he will send it out to you guys, or I'll bring it to the class next week. Okay, Shimon, thank you, everybody. Shimon thank moved you. to uh, Dan. Shimon moved to Dan. Shimon moves to Dan? Not yes, exactly. Yes, Dan moves yes. from place to place. No, 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 no. Shimon moved to the north where Nachal Dan used to be another Yishuv there and they killed them all and they took it over in the time from uh, Micha. That is Dan. Dan moves no. from the area of uh, the area of the Merkaz up to the north. That's in the end of Sefer Shoftim. It's yeah. Shevet Dan that moves from one place to another. You're right with the story, wrong with the Shevet. You're right. Thank okay. You. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shirley.